Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Teaching with Inquiry Live. Thank you so much for joining me. And I hope that everyone is doing fantastic and awesome and that you are not like me getting hit with things like a sore throat or anything that might be that because I am certainly feeling the back to school sickness beginning to set in. So we'll see if I can feel better so that I don't have to uh, take too much time off. So I'm hoping that you're taking lots of vitamin C and feeling good and all of that great stuff. So tonight I wanted to talk to you about some of the things that I have been kind of chatting about with other teachers. And one of those things in particular is how to know when to start things like guided reading and the interplay between teaching your students to work as independent workers while also managing the classroom and meeting the individual needs of your students. So kind of how all three of those components really interplay with one another and how we can kind of set ourselves up for success. Because I think so many of us put pressure on ourselves to get this guided reading started right away. And then other times we're often, we can forget that the ability for our students to work independently has to happen after we have key routines of independent work skills established in our classroom. And we can't really get students too deep into tough content while we're building that. So we're going to like map all of that out and really talk about the interplay of those three components, getting started on the actual parts of teaching and classroom management and building those independent workers so that you can actually get some of this stuff done. So that's kind of where we're going tonight because that seems to be the topic of what I'm talking about with most teachers these days. So if you are new to Teaching with Inquiry Live, thank you so much for joining me. My name is Patty, and I am the teacher blogger behind madlylearning.com and I come live every single Monday night to talk about teaching and using inquiry-based practices all throughout your classroom experience. Now, if you're like me and you're wanting to use more inquiry-based learning in your classroom, one of the key skills your students need to master is being able to work independently. This is especially the case if you happen to be teaching a split because there are going to be moments where you need to work with one group of students while the other group of students are engaged in an independent task and don't need you constantly. So we have to set the stage to allow this to happen. And for so many times I will hear teachers say to me, these students can't work independently. Many students can work independently. In fact, I would even argue that most students can work independently under the right condition. And when we can set up those conditions to be in our classroom, then we can have making sure that we have all of these pieces put together so that we can set our students up for success so that we can actually get down to the business of teaching. So. First things first, the very first thing you need to focus on if you want to be able to get down to the business of teaching and building those independent work skills is certainly your classroom management. Your classroom management has got to be the first thing that you're doing and setting your students up for success. So if you're looking at building independent work skills with your students, then you need to create an environment that you allow your students to be able to problem solve on their own without you. Most of the time, students can't work independently because A, they don't trust themselves to get it right, and they feel as though they need you for every step along the way, and they're probably used to a whole lot of teacher handholding and believing that they can't do it right unless the teacher helps them through it. So we need to kind of break them of that mold. So some of the things that I am doing 
to set my students up, to make sure that they have the belief of themselves that they are capable of solving their own problems and that they themselves can work independently. It's okay if they make mistakes and that's fine in the classroom and trusting themselves that they are capable of working independently and solving problems. So the first thing that I do is I give my students a simple, 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 easy task, such as independently reading. And I'm not actually even concerned if they're reading. I just want to get them to sit quietly focused on one thing without disturbing other people. And we practice this, and we've practiced this for weeks. Every day since the first day of school, we are still practicing this skill. And eventually I'm building in more complex tasks as we're getting started. But to begin, I simply just have them independently reading. And we meet together, we discuss what the criteria looks like for independent reading. And if students are those students that are gonna struggle with a book, they have an iPad and they're looking at Epic, or they are reading something that is personally relevant to them. Really, again, the goal here is to teach them to be focused and on one task at all times. And if they can listen to reading on Epic, because reading for them has been a struggle and they don't want other people to notice that they can't do it, then I will have them listening to reading on an iPad if that's where they can be. So I get them started and I time them. I time them for how long they can maintain that focus. So the first time we did it this year, we lasted 38 seconds. That is how long my students were able, as a whole group, to sustain independent work. And I celebrated that because it was longer than 37 seconds and longer than 20 seconds, and at least they got 10 seconds down. But we also had to make a goal as to what we were gonna do the next time. And five minutes later, we did it again, we reviewed our expectations, we did it again, and we got up to seven minutes the second time. So from 38 seconds to seven minutes is a huge gain. But I want my students to understand exactly what I am looking for, so I stop them the minute one of my students is off task. Not all of them, not most of them, but one of them, when they're off task and then we stop and we go over and we model what it looks like to work independently or what it means to read independently and then we go back and we keep rehearsing this over and over again. The task they're doing at this point doesn't matter. It's not as important as what the behaviors I'm asking them to engage in. If I can at least get them to independently read, that's a start and I can slowly build in more skills as students are going. Now, if reading is simply just not the task that your students can start with, try drawing or art or listening to reading if they if that's something that's going to be more appropriate for your students. But it has to be at the very basic, look at your lowest student's ability to sustain independent work and everyone has to do that. And start there and then build on that skill. <clears throat> Now there will come a time where you may have some students where they'll be need to fidget so they can be moving, but as you can position them somewhere in your classroom where they're not going to be quite as distracting to others. And this is a constant rehearsal as we are building in those skills to make sure that they are really simply just learning how to behave when I'm not around. Specifically too, when they're doing this, I am nowhere near them. I will often sit in my chair at the front of the room and pay attention to them while not being really obvious so that they can't really see me looking at them. I'm paying attention to them and I'm scanning the room, but I will try to make myself look busy or like I'm doing something so that they don't have me reinforcing that the only time they have to behave is say if I'm wandering around my classroom. So I absolutely do not wander around my classroom, but I will sit off to the side away so that my physical presence is not a reinforcer to make sure that they're sustaining independent work. I want them to really practice what that behavior looks like. We cannot start anything in my classroom until at least we can get up to the 10 minute mark consistently. We just can't. We have to keep building and I will push off starting every DRA small group and guided reading session until my students can get to that point. So if that means that I can't get guided reading started in my classroom till November, 
so be it. I don't have a rush. I can still get assessment material before that point. I just can't get it in small groups perhaps. So I'm certainly not going to be pulling my students into small groups at that point because they can't handle it. So that's the first one is getting your students to practice the behavior. Don't worry about the actual task they're doing. It's just about reinforcing and setting the norms for the behavior that you expect during independent work. So first is behavior. Then you can slowly, as you get up past that 10 minute point, you can slowly introduce new tasks that your students can do. However, one of the biggest problems that students have with independent work is the fact that they don't know what to do. And I like to think of independent tasks as being a box. And within that box, I build the wall. So I build the structures and the limits for what my students can do. But there's a lot of different options within that box that students can choose how they're going to accomplish that task. So I build the framework, but there's choice built inside that framework that students can choose. For example, for independent writing, students can choose the writing form. My expectation is I want a grade five quality piece of writing within the next two weeks. Their choices within there are going to be the topic and the form of writing. I have no expectations at this point for what their grade five level writing looks like at this point. I just want them putting words down on paper. I can deal with the quality of their work later. Most students can put some ideas down, even if it's just simply brainstorming a list or me providing a scaffold Um, so that they have sentence starters that they can simply just finish and plug in answers to. But I want to give each student the simplest form that they can accomplish independently. Most of the time the behaviors happen in my room or the disengagement and silliness happens because my students, I'm giving them too challenging of a task and I need to simplify it because they may be able to do it with me at their instructional level, but it's not yet at their independent level. So I need to lower my expectations at this point about what their independent level looks like until they've built up the stamina to be able to sustain doing more challenging tasks. It also means that there's going to be a lot of trust that needs to be built at this point because students need to learn that they are safe to fail with you. That if they make a mistake, it's not the end of the world and there's always simply a next step. That they can give you the wrong answer and it will become a learning opportunity. That they can guess at the answer and that's okay and any guess is an acceptable guess. A lot of the times students feel like they don't know what to do because they don't know what the right answer is and they only want to put the right answer. So we need to also be building up with our students the ability for them to make choices, make decisions within their context and to take ownership of their learning to ensure that they can take those risks and put themselves out there and manage and handle that failure. So many times students rely so, so heavily on the teacher telling them exactly what needs to happen. And this is a huge adjustment for those students because you as the teacher need to step out of their way, get out of their way and stop telling them what to do, which is really hard as a teacher because it's kind of what we're used to doing is telling them what to do. So for example, if a student comes up and says, I don't know what expanded form looks like, because that was a question that happened in my class today, I don't know what expanded form is. I could take that opportunity to give that student the answer. However, by doing that, it allows, it teaches that student that when they are confronted with something they don't know, that I am the person that's going to give them the solution. What I want my students to begin to realize is that they can give themselves the solution or they can use resources around them, that they are capable of finding their own solutions as well as taking the risks to get it wrong, knowing full well that we're gonna take up the page in 10 minutes and then they will see their mistake, they will see the correct answer they'll be able to analyze where they went wrong and not make that mistake the next time. So instead of answering the student's question about what is expanded form, my response is, what do you think expanded form is? I want you to take a guess, use your best guess as to what you think expanded form could look like, but don't worry, 
we're going to take it up and you're going to be able to figure it out so that tomorrow when you do this page again, you will feel much more confident about what it is. But right now, I want you to take the risk to guess what the answer might be. This is really uncomfortable for students and it causes some stress and anxiety for them, so you do need to watch it. But over the long run, we are building problem solvers and students that rely less on us as teachers and rely more on each other, which is a really important aspect because there are 30 kids in many junior classes right now and one teacher. We're not having educational supports. We don't have resource support in our classrooms. There's one of us and often 30 of them. We cannot be the person that answers all of their questions because we simply just don't have enough time in the day. And if we are doing all of that work, our students are not. And they're the ones that are there to learn, so we really have to put some of that ownership back on them so that when they are encountering problems and we are not available because we're in a small group or with the other grade or working one-on-one -on -one with another student, that they have the ability and capability to solve their own problems. Now, this could be helpful if you actually take time with your students to create an anchor chart that allows them to come up with steps that they could follow if they're not sure of what the answer is. So how could you solve your own problem? You also want to put limitations on what they need to do prior to coming to ask you a question. You can use strategies such as ask three before me, which requires them to ask three other people in the classroom before they come and ask you. You could also just have simply a stoplight or a little light on your desk and when the light is on, it doesn't matter, they're not disturbing you, you're off limits. So they have to struggle through that problem. It's totally okay to let our kids struggle. We don't have to help them or cushion their environment so that they never struggle and they never fail. Failing in a very soft way where you've got all of the safety nets in place, if they fall off that learning trapezoid, or not trapezoid, that's a shape, trapeze. If they're falling off the learning trapeze, they've got nets underneath them. You're there, but right now you need to teach them how that how they can, it, that it's okay to let go and to fall and to fail and you will be there to pick them back up and put them back up on that trapeze, but they've got to trust that it's okay to fall. So as teachers, we need to become more comfortable with helping our students less and building up their ability to solve their own problems. And we can do that by teaching them how to solve those problems, by giving them strategies that they could use, and also helping them through it as they're, and coaching them through it instead of being always the solution to their problem. All right, so we have the other aspect of that is to make sure that teachers as us, we are not the center of the classroom. Learning is the center of our classroom. Our students are the learners and we are simply there to help to facilitate and coach them along that journey. And this will help them to understand that our role is not to spoon feed every single thing to them. And this will help them to build up that independent skill. So what you're looking for when you're building independent workers is you want to have students that are able to behaviorally sustain attention for at least 10 minutes with the simplest possible task. And you are not doing anything else during that time but monitoring secretly as a super secret spy. But you're monitoring. Until they can get to that 10 minutes, you can't do you can't do small group instruction. You're not helping individual students. They shouldn't need help. They should be engaged in something that's so simple. No student in your class needs help. So you are making sure that you are monitoring their behavior. They're monitoring their focus. You're redirecting them as needed. You're pulling them back, rehearsing those routines, going back over them and then letting them practice again until they can build up that stamina. And you have to be really sticky about that, but it's all at the beginning about classroom management. Once they get down to the classroom management piece and you've got at least 10 minutes, you're gonna aim for 20, but you can start doing a bit more work once they've hit that 10 minute mark. Once they've hit that 10 minute mark, then you can start introducing higher level tasks that they can be engaged in. But again, those tasks need to build in choice and have a lot of open-ended tasks where there's lots of multiple entry points. 
If you plan one solitary activity for every student in your class, guaranteed there's going to be kids that cannot access that. The minute you have students that cannot access the activity, that's when you're gonna have your behavioral issues in the classroom, the disengaged learners and the classroom management nightmare and the inability for that student to work independently. So you need to have an open-ended task, such as choose what you're going to write for your writer's workshop. I'll give you the framework, but you're going to choose what it is that you can do within that framework. And whatever you're able to accomplish, that's where we're gonna start and we're gonna move you forward from that point forward. Students that have choice and autonomy in what they're doing in their classroom are always going to be more engaged if they're the one choosing the activity versus if the teacher is choosing the activity. So if you can build in voice and choice into every aspect of, independent, of an independent task, students are going to be far more engaged, which makes it much easier for them to sustain their independent work skills. So if you've got one worksheet for your whole class, you're probably going to be asking for some trouble there with what it is that they're going to do unless there's some open-ended aspects to that worksheet. Once you can build in those two pieces where students can now do work and they can still sustain their attention for about 10 to 20 minutes, finally, you are then ready to look at doing some small group intervention and instruction. Don't get full into it yet because you're probably only going to have about five minutes before you might have to intervene with another student. But you could do, say, add DRA. If you did add DRA with a student that you knew was going to be reading at grade level, you could work with that one student, quickly do their reading assessment, and then monitor the other students as they are working. So you can do a DRA, I can do a running record while also kind of watching around what's happening in my room and still being able to monitor. But I can work and get that assessment done while my students are working on those independent tasks that they're working on. Once I can consistently get my students to understand that when I'm working with a student, they can still sustain that independent task then I'm finally then at that point able to do small group instruction because through those opportunities, my students have learned how to solve their small problems by themselves. They've learned to use the other expertise that's within my classroom. So maybe the student who is a really good listener, who is listening to the lesson in the classroom, they can ask them before they ask me. You can build in some of those problem solving skills so that not every small problem the student's running to you for support. As the teacher, you can stop being the one to answer those questions because if you answer them, they'll keep coming back. If you stop answering them and the students start knowing you as if they're gonna ask, your response is always gonna be, what do you think you should do at this point in time? And you're not actually gonna answer the question, you automatically are putting that problem back on the student and getting them to come up with solutions to their problems that would be acceptable in that time period. Getting ourselves used to not helping our students as much. Once all of those are in play, then you can begin doing things like guided reading. That's when you can start to do um, really authentic split grade learning where you're splitting up your grade levels. You might at this point not be ready to flip flop your instruction completely because you've got one group on the carpet and one group doing something independently. You might have to be really, really careful about what it is that other group is doing. They could be doing something like art if that's what they can accomplish independently, they might not be able to do research skills at this point because it's too much right now. So you really have to judge if you want your students to be working independently, what activity are you actually asking them to do and making sure that it's within that zone of independent work skills that they can do without support. That often means it's going to be far easier than what they can do with your support at this point in time. So I hope that's giving you some ideas about how to build up those independent work skills. What are some of those underlying reasons why your students are continually coming up and asking you questions and what you can do about it, as well as giving you some room to breathe and understanding that most teachers are probably not successfully doing guided reading or guided instruction yet. 
It's not happening. They're not ready. Unless you have one of those brilliant miracle classrooms where every student just knows how to work automatically. And if you do, please invite me to come teach there. But if you don't, and you are like me and every other teacher I know, it's okay to not be ready to do guided reading right now. It's okay to delay that. You're still working with small groups of students. It just might not be guided reading yet because they're not ready and that's okay. So I hope that's giving you some ideas for independent instruction and I am gonna sign off and take care of my voice and I will see you again next week as we're continuing to talk about teaching using inquiry-based teaching practice is in all of our subjects. Now, just as an added bonus, if you're still sticking around, I did want to mention to you that my Ignited Literacy product is on sale for 20% off tonight until midnight. After midnight, the sale is done. If you have been humming and hawing whether or not Ignited Literacy is for you and you want some strategies on how you can build up that independent work skills within your language program, then you can head on over to www.ignitedliteracy.com and you can check out the Ignited Literacy Bundle. You can download a free sample week if you're curious and you can get that bundle on sale 20% off just until tonight at midnight. Thank you so much and I will see you next week. Bye for now.